start uh, by thanking Father Spirit on again. I'm having to make an overt effort on the inside to uh, put aside how excited he made me and think about what I'm supposed to be talking about. Thank God that we have People in positions, really, uh, a pharmacist, doctors, PAs, nurses, uh, that can speak with great authority on these topics. It, uh, I will be taking more of a pastoral perspective on things, which is my area of expertise if I have one. Uh, but what a blessing it is to have people that are there who are being asked to hand out the pills, right, who can tell you what is really going on. With that, that confidence factor uh, is amazing. So thank you. Thank you, Father Spirito. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, can, can you guys hear me? Yes. I can't really tell what it sounds like. If I'm too loud, just go like this. <laughs> I'm going to be speaking about the psychological and the spiritual effects of abortion. And this was an exciting topic for me. Uh, I, do not, I do not watch TV. I don't listen to the news. Uh, so a lot of the time I am wonderfully ignorant of what is really going on up there. Uh, I do that. I do that intentionally uh, in order to save my soul. This is for me personally. I'm not asking everyone to Im to uh, to imitate me. But for me personally, I just I just don't do it. I, I find that I it is it is very depressing for me to uh, be exposed too much to what the world is doing. We know where it's going. We know already. You know, uh, I like to tell conspiracy theorists, you know, really there's only one conspiracy, and it's a real conspiracy, and that is the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist coming. Uh, that is the conspiracy that is out there. Everything else to me is, is details that I don't like paying attention to much, unless I have to, unless I need to, and then I, and then I get excited about things. And so, but first of all, I would like to point out that today is Saturday in Lent, and it is one of the Saturdays of the souls. This is one of the days in the church year that we commemorate the departed. Uh, many many, many uh, churches in different places uh, had services this morning specifically uh, celebrating the memory of the departed and praying for their salvation. So what a wonderful day to be talking about abortion. Uh, it is also the feast of the miracle of St. Theodore the Recruit who was an early martyr in the church, and to about 50 years after his martyrdom, the apostate emperor Julian, we call him Julian the Apostate, grew up orthodox, studied in the faith, and yet apostatized later and became emperor. Incredible stories going on between him and St. Basil, the great St. Basil and he were uh, classmates in theology earlier in life. Imagine that. And at the end, you have this great <laughs> bishop of the church, and, and, and one of his schoolmates is the apostate emperor of the empire. And just incredible, incredible story there. But Julian the apostate, wanting to, on this day, we celebrate it today, uh, wanting to, to mess up Lent for the Christians, took blood from sacrifices that had been offered to the pagan gods and sprinkled that blood all over the food in the marketplace. And these are the days before the refrigerator, remember. So everybody is shopping on a daily basis almost. And St. Theodore appeared uh, to one of the bishops in a dream and warned him that this had been done, that the food had been defiled with the blood of uh, pagan sacrifices. And 
gave him and told him for the people to eat a boiled weed. And this is where the tradition of koliba comes from. So they all boiled the wheat that they would have at home in store to make bread, and they, and they lived on that until the food that had been defiled was put away. And there is an image there, at least in my mind, that we can celebrate today where, you know, Julian the Apostate, in my mind, is an icon of being in a post-Christian society. We are in a nation that had Judeo-Christian roots, and it is throwing them off, or has thrown them off. And there is always greater turmoil in a nation that has apostatized than a nation that is simply unillumined. You can go to the wilds of South Africa or Africa, South America or Africa or somewhere and find wild pagans doing all kinds of crazy things who have never heard of Christ. St. Innocent uh, of Alaska encountered this in Alaska where you know, people are doing wild and weird things. But you know what? A lot of the times, it's out of very good intentions. They are doing, in, in true paganism, ancient paganism, uh, the effort was to encounter God. Why were they worshiping fire or a waterfall or, or fertility or whatever? They were trying to find God. There is an honorability to, to what they were doing that, that you do not find in neo-paganism or that you do not find in a post-Christian society. We are casting off the truth that has been revealed to us. That is a much worse, much, much worse place to be in. So we praise St. Theodore today who, uh, who intervened on behalf of the people in an apostate situation, uh, a post-Christian situation. And the blood, as the blood of the, of the pagan sacrifices was sprinkled on everything that the people were intended to encounter, so the blood of, of the aborted children in our country is, on, it is threatening to be on us as well, is it not? Is it something that we are going to fast from, call out as wrong, and abstain from ourselves? Uh, or are we going to participate in it because we do not want to be inconvenienced, or we are afraid, we are ashamed of what the faith teaches us? So through the prayers of St. Theodore, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Today. Now, Father Spirito did a wonderful job at uh, pointing out already the scriptural references of God's encounter with man in the womb. Thank you, Father. It was uh, just wonderful and inspiring. So I just want to very quickly uh, reiterate that from the very beginning of, of, the, of Israel and, and, and what will later become the Christian church, Abortion was just seen as absolutely unacceptable. When the Roman Empire took over the Middle East and the Jews came under their influence, the Jews were horrified, horrified to find out that a Roman father was legally the owner of his children. The owner. And he could do anything with them that he wanted to do. Uh, and it was a common practice in Roman times among the Romans that if another, if a child was born and the father particularly did not want the child, uh, they could kill it without hesitation, have it killed. Um, and that if they, the merciful thing to do would to be to put the child on the outside the gates of the city or the village, and that maybe, hopefully, the merciful thing done was that a peasant would come along who could use another child at home to work the farm and that they would take the child into their care before the child was died from exposure or was eaten by wild beasts. So that was the, that was the condition that the Jews encountered in, under the Roman Empire, and they were horrified. The Jewish, uh, the, the people of Israel had such an incredible and wonderful uh, practice of adoption uh, of adoption. It's a, it's a whole other wonderful study that when they adopted somebody into their family, that person became absolutely one of them. They had no, no concern for genetics at all. When you said, this is my son, or this is my daughter, it did not matter where they came from, the child of a slave, the child of a, a relative, a child you found outside the gates, it didn't matter. When you declared them by, by the practice of adoption as they understood it, that that child was now part of you, it was absolute. 
There was no debate about who your mother and father were. There's no debate about inheritance. Uh, if anyone were to ever suggest somehow that child was less of a representative of the family than the, than the biological children, uh, they would have been met with great hostility. And this, this idea of adoption was so strong that when Christ and the apostles start teaching that we are going to be adopted to God the Father, it was, it, it was heresy. Because that meant you were going to become divine. Their understanding of adoption was so strong. You will be of the Father in your family if you were adopted. Therefore, being adopted unto God the Father, you will be of Him. You will be divine. And so, from that, from that basis even, then you get into the early church, as Father pointed out, there's not all of these, uh, all of these uh, comments that people should not be, abort not be aborting, stop aborting, do all these things, because the people didn't do it. As, as the church goes into a time later on, within even the first century, of being influenced by non-Judeo-Christian influences, then you see it being called out as something that Christians do not do. So we, ha we have in the Didache from 70 AD, you shall not slay the child by abortion. Any questions? <laughs> uh, the canons of the fathers uh, gave a person from 5 to 10 years out of communion, 5 to 10 years out of communion for having an abortion or participating in, uh, in giving an abortion or causing an abortion. The, the issue is so hotly debated among the fathers, although there are general agreements as to what the penance for abortion uh, should be, there isn't consensus. Because they, when they looked at infanticide, when they looked at a, the planned murder of a child, and in those days, the odds of the woman dying from trying to get an abortion were so high that uh, St. Basil the Great particularly calls out that really the first sin you're committing is suicide. You are risking your own life because you don't want to be inconvenienced with this child. That, and he says in their case, in, the, in their time, the second, the second sin that is a double murder, the child is going to die as well. Uh, and St. John Chrysostom simply says clearly, which is worse, the aborter or the doctor that does the abortion? We don't, I mean, they, they actually could not agree on that. It was such a hot topic and so uh, inconceivable to them that somebody would even be trying to do this in the first place. Uh, and even with penances of five or ten years, uh, St. Basil the Great says very clearly that it is the, it is the, the nature of, of the woman particularly, or the person that performed the abortion, it's the nature of the repentance that would make that length shorter or longer. Are they truly entering into to repentance? So, hot topic from the very beginning. Uh, when you look all the way, thank God on this topic, thank God, when you look at the various modern, here in America, archdiocese and opinions on abortion, you see very clearly everywhere the church's clear stand that abortion is murder. Abortion is murder. And St. Basil the Great, in his, uh, one of the letters of his, or the first canonical letter, the second canon that he gives, is this, quote, and it summarizes everything. This is St. This is Basil in the 4th century. So if you think the church has not encountered these problems before, honestly, really, you have not studied church history clearly enough. There is no question going on in the modern era that has never been answered. The details now may be more complex. But the question has, it has not been unanswered. St. Basil says, The woman who purposely destroys her unborn child is guilty of murder. And listen to this. Fourth century. And this is exactly what Father was saying already and what we need to keep in our mind. The hair-splitting difference between the form and the unformed makes no difference to us. Right. All this compartmentalization, talking about renaming everything, if it's not a human being until seven stages later. We don't care. We don't care. That is literally the bold and authoritative answer. The hair-splitting difference between the formed and the unformed 
makes no difference to us. So that is where the Orthodox Church stands. Glory to God. Now, when I started looking at studies specific to the effect, the psychological and ultimately the spiritual effect of abortion on women, uh, it was very fascinating. Thousands of studies, thousands online. You can go onto Google, you can look up uh, psychological effect abortion. Thousands of studies will come up. If you look at one of the options, you click scholarly articles, and it's not newspapers or anything, it's literally psychological studies. Hundreds of them being done over and over again, particularly in America in English before uh, Roe versus Wade in uh, 1973. So from the mid-60s, particularly when the argument is going, the, the ground is being laid to legalize abortion, these studies begin. And it is amazing, you watch these studies, and they are, quite honestly, they're just, they're politicized. So you get these studies and will say, oh, there's absolutely, we surveyed all these hundreds of women, there's absolutely no problem with abortion at all, it improved their lives, it's wonderful. In the same year, you have another study saying it's absolutely terrible, all of them are, 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 are doing terrible, it has massive psychological trauma. Back and forth, back and forth, as people are trying to use studies in order to justify their position politically. Uh, you find variables that are hard to uh, calculate into the whole, the whole survey of the information. One of them is that people who are pro-abortion or who have had an abortion and are pro-abortion don't tell the truth. And I don't mean that they're just overt liars. If you've done something, this is fallen human nature, if you have done something you don't want to find out that it's wrong. And so even if on the inside you are sick over it, you have guilt, you have shame, you have some sort of psychological and spiritual trauma, if, you don't, if you're not ready to come to grips with the reality of what you have done, you, you justify having done it, and you deny how you really feel about it. And the studies themselves demonstrate that to be true, where you get, you get inconsistent uh, information from different groups, depending on how you ask the question, and when and why, in the state that they're in mentally, emotionally at the time that the question is asked. Uh, it, it's pointed out in the studies very clearly, these are generalizations, but, but very clearly, easy to demonstrate, that, that the, there was even, there's condemnation even of religious convictions because a lot of studies pointed out that the people who suffered the most, the women who suffered the most, were the ones who believed that it was wrong. <laughs> it makes sense, doesn't it? When they had an abortion and inside the, the, their, their intuition or their spiritual formation was that, that it was a baby that had been killed, they suffered greatly. When, when, the, when the same studies would survey uh, atheistic uh, nations or cultures uh, or, or unchristianized areas, there was, there was clearly a, a lack of psychological trauma after an abortion because the people did not believe that it was wrong. And so that state of mind uh, dictates in a, in a lot of ways it would appear at first whether or not the people suffer uh, afterwards from having an abortion. This, this focus, I will say people, the focus was obviously particularly on women who had had abortion, but also on uh, the fathers of the children at times playing into the studies. Um, and also another variable is that people who had abortions and then had, had kids later, went to full term later, had the child in their arm, uh, would experience trauma. Because having, having the reality of that baby in their arm made, made the reality that they had, even if they believed it was just a potential human in the womb earlier, the, the reality that they brought that life to an end uh, would set in. And so different studies, whether they are for or against abortion, would point those things out or, or, or deny them or pretend it wasn't happening or change the data based on whether what their, uh, the group was that they were serving. But then in the, in the early 2000s, something radical started changing in, in, the, in the science of psychologists, psychiatrists uh, studying particularly women who have had abortion. And in 2004, so this is recent studies, 2004 there was a Russian-American study and it was looking at the cultural differences between America and Russia in regards to abortion as one of the topics. 
And this study concluded that of the American women, American women who had abortions, 14.3% of them developed full-on PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, 14.3%. Then in 2010, uh, the Canadian Journal of Psychiatrist, Psychiatry reported in their study, 2010, that 98%, 98 women out of every 100 surveyed were at a post-abortion mental risk for, of mental health. 98% of them were at an elevated risk for a, a, a breakdown in mental health because of having an abortion. These, these studies are, are countered immediately by pro-abortion studies, you'll find. In 2011, a study came out uh, out of Britain, and I love that these are other countries doing these things, particularly the European countries, because they are ahead of us in their post-Christian uh, devolution. And in 2011, Britain's Royal College of Psychiatrists it is often referred to as the Coleman study. Coleman was the, the head psychiatrist who was uh, heading up the study. 2011, the largest study on the effects of abortion psychologically on women was published in 2011. It was the largest study ever done. 22 studies combined together. They gathered material from 1995 to 2009. Almost a million women participated, by far the largest study, uh, uh, 10 or 20 times bigger than, than the other large studies that have been done. 877,000 women participated from six different countries. This is very broad. Uh, uh, 164,000 of the women had abortions during the study. So a large part, of the, all of them had had an abortion, then a large percentage of them had an abortion during the study. All 22 studies, all 22 showed an elevated risk for anxiety, depression, drug and alcohol abuse, and suicide after having an abortion. Every study. The conclusion of the study was that, and listen to this, the, the conclusion of the study, this is a secular world study, Unbelievers looking at the results of abortion concluded that 81, you had an 81% chance of psychological crisis if you had an abortion. Eight, over 8 out of 10 women having an abortion have an have a identifiable psychological crisis after it happened. Uh, that study in 2011 just caused an incredible reaction within the pro-abortion uh, uh, people to try and fight it back, to try and come up with their own studies, to try and disprove what it said. But it is such a humongous study, so many people, so much data, so many questions, that it is absolutely the, uh, you know, it is the cornerstone of data today, the Coleman study. 81% chance of psych psychological trauma after having one abortion. Another uh, institute that I enjoyed uh, researching on and they have up-to-date information. It's called the Elliott Institute for Social Science Research. Uh, their data is from 2017, even, some of it. And they have an abortion section where they track specifically abortion data coming out as it shows the risk associated with abortion. So the current stats from the Elliott Institute say that uh, if you have an abortion, you are four times more likely to abuse drug and alcohol. Four times. 10% of the people were hospitalized for psych psychiatric care. So I'm going to say one out of 10 to make it more personal. One out of every person, one out of every 10 people who had an abortion were admitted into a psychiatric hospital. Two out of 10 people post abortion reported a nervous breakdown. Three out of 10 attempted suicide. Think of this. Think of the medical community doing this to the people. You are going to come in, we're going to give you a pill over the counter, it's going to be very simple, you might get a tummy ache. And three out of ten women attempt suicide afterwards. This is, this is absolute irresponsibility on the part of our government and the medical community. 
Six out of ten people said their lives were made worse. Over seven out of ten said that the abortion did not improve their lives at all. And 98%, 9.8 people out of 10, said that they regretted having the abortion. Wow. So, that's the world saying that. Okay? That's the world saying that. They don't even know what the real problem is. Father Spirito touched on it. They don't, they, they've forgotten what a human being is. But that is the world still saying, this is not a good practice, it is not good for us, and everyone that does it suffers. Suffers to a certain degree. And so, what? in order to contextualize that, you know, that's a bunch of math, a bunch of data, we know that it's wrong, the church <coughs> condemns it, now science is saying clearly that it is not a good practice either. But what is the real problem? Ultimately, Father has touched on this already, I want to expound on it. What is the problem ultimately? And the problem ultimately is what we will call an ontological dilemma. It's a big word for the day. I love that word. It's an ontological dilemma. Ontology is the study of the nature of being. What are we? What does it mean to be a human being? And what am I as a human being in, in, in relation to what abortion is and what abortion is doing? We can condemn it easily. But what is it actually doing, and what is the deeper, deeper problem going on? And so in order to really understand what is the effects of abortion having on women and on society in general, uh, we have to start with what is a human being in regards to things particular to abortion. So let's look at that for a little bit. Some of this might be uh, things Father pointed out already too, but we're going we're gonna to find out that within orthodoxy the answer is always the same. <laughs> I said to one of the fathers earlier, I remember Father Thomas Hopko at going to a retreat where he was speaking, and they would always give him the, kind of the most wild, uh, uh, you know, complex themes to speak on to try and get him to, you know, illuminate us on, on some obscure topic. And I remember him warning the, the assembly of people there that, you know, you're probably going to be disappointed with the answer. Because in the end, the answer is always the same. It's Christ. The answer is salvation. The answer is becoming like him. That is the answer to everything. And so uh, I'm not going to talk about fasting and prayer, but, uh, but Father Thomas warned everybody that, that in the end, that's what you're talking about. So what are we as human beings? What, what is it about our ontology, our personal ontology as human beings that is in conflict with abortion? So we turn back to Genesis 1.26. And we see the Holy Trinity saying to itself, Let us make man in our image. Let's make man like us, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over all the earth. That's like being like God. We are like him in his image, in his likeness, and we are to have dominion over everything in our life. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. From the beginning we are like God when we have gender, two genders, male and female. And then God gives him a commandment, Genesis 1.28, the first thing out of his mouth to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And so we have, we are, we are creatures made in the image of God, and one of the most primary things we are going to do is reproduce. Remember, God is Trinity. God is Trinity. He's not a monad. When we say God, we're talking about three persons. And so the the the, we have to be very careful that we don't have heresy in trying to make this, uh, this uh, comparison, but there is a multitude of persons that is inherent to the Holy Trinity. And so man, being in the image of God, is going to have a multiplication of persons. 
It's a divine, it's one of the aspects in which we are like God in his image and likeness. And then in Genesis 5.3 it says, And Adam begot a son in his own likeness after his own image. So not only are we like God in, in, and like God in having children, but when we have a child, that child is in our image and likeness, which means it's in God's image and likeness. And so we are empowered by God, being like God, to bring other human beings into existence that are created in the image of likeness of God, too. It's incredible. It's incredible who we actually are as human beings, authentic human beings, real human beings. And then, so here we have, we have Adam and Eve, they're having children. Their children are like God because they are like God and their children are like them. We have an icon of the Holy Trinity in the family with a father and a mother and a child. And we see that it doesn't stop there, but God particularly, he has this interest and this focus on the womb. On the womb. The womb. I made a little note here to myself. God doesn't say much about the male reproductive system. And it's true. That <laughs> the people who don't know I'm gonna be tempted to say this are already embarrassed, but there is one clear reference to male reproductive parts in scripture. One. It's in Deuteronomy. And it says, when a husband is fighting with another man, the woman, the wife of the man, the husband, can come to his defense and do anything she wants to help her husband beat the other guy up. But she can't hit him. She can't give him a low blow. <laughs> Boxing didn't end up. It's from God. It is just that unfair. <laughs> we have Adam promise that his seed would be blessed. His offspring would be blessed. Abraham is the father of many nations, right? So obviously God is, is, is dealing with a man and his offspring. Isaac, Jacob, and David are all promised that from their bodies would come forth the Savior. But when it comes to men, it, it sort of stops there, that emphasis. Our participation is obviously needed. We are called to be fathers and husbands. Um, but when you start looking at Scripture and the womb, it's unbelievable. Depending on the, the, the uh, translation that you're reading, the Bible says, has the word womb, 71 to 91 times in Scripture. It's a thick book. You might not think that's very, very often, but if in all of Holy Scripture, a hundred times, God, His prophets, the saints, the apostles, stop and talk about the womb, it's important. It's important. It's a lot. It's occurring a lot. Uh, when we look at God's interaction with just the barren womb, just the barren womb, you know, not the promise of Israel that from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David, this, all of these nations would come forth and the Messiah would blossom from their seed. Not that. Let's look at just, just barren wombs. And we find that Sarah gives birth to Isaac when Abraham is a hundred years old. Rebecca gives birth to Jacob. These are barren women. Rachel gives birth to Joseph. The wife of Manoah gives birth to Samson. Hannah gives birth to Samuel. The Shunammite woman gives birth to her son after not having had kids with the help of the prophet Elijah. Elizabeth gives birth to John the Baptist. From a barren womb comes the greatest of men. And from a barren womb, Anna gives birth to the Theotokos. Then we, we look at 
uh, well, liturgically, and Father pointed this out some, but uh, I went, I have a very simple version of the, of the, uh, the music that we sing in church on my computer that I was able to search a little bit. So this is not thorough at all. These are minimum numbers. But you throw up, you pull up uh, the Menean, or you pull up, pull up the Festal Menean, or other liturgical text, and you type in, you search for the word womb. And all of a sudden we have, at the entrance of the Theotokos feast, just in the liturgy alone, not, not the hymns leading up to it, not Vespers, not Matins, in the liturgy alone we say womb five times in church. Womb, we say it in our worship. At the conception of the Feast of the Theotokos, just the liturgy, we say womb nine times. On Nativity, we say it 15 times. I mean, think about that. We're in church singing, and 15 times we refer to the woman's womb. On the Nativity of the Theotokos, we say it 22 times. At the Nativity of St. John the Baptist, we say it 30 times. Imagine if I had just asked you now, say womb 30 times. <laughs> and we do it in a divine service. When I got done doing that little bit of research for myself even, I realized that, that if people want to accuse the church of, some, of something honestly, it would be much more uh, fitting and, and maybe even threatening to accuse the church of being a feminine fertility Worship, you know. <laughs> it would stick. The idea that, that we are chauvinistic or misogynistic is, is insane. The woman is celebrated so much so when you really dig into this, it's awesome. And, 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 and it, it, it teaches you to understand our love for the Theotokos. It teaches us to, to honor and to, to love and to, to, uh, to glorify our women. I even thought, you know, if you really wanted to, to take a look at it, you know, God is the Father and the Son is the Son. But, but the womb is so important in our faith that really we have men serving that glorification of fe femininity in the priesthood, in the diaconate, among the bishops. And I don't want to take that too far. But, but we, are, we are standing in the altar area, we are facing the apse, which is the womb of the altar area, and there is an icon of the Panagia with Christ in, in her womb above us, and that is what we are serving in submission to. Christ as God is above her always, even in the iconography of the church. But as a person, there is no other purely human being in the church that we hold higher than the mother of God. We are serving her, and we are serving her son. It's a powerful, powerful realization to have. And so then, and, and we're not even talking yet about the Theotokos. We're not even talking about the Theotokos, who, in, who is not uh, barren, but she is a virgin. A virgin's womb. Luke one thirty one. Behold, you will conceive in your womb. The Savior. We sing over and over again throughout the liturgical year, you, O Christ, sanctified the virgin's womb. That's an incredibly powerful word. Not honor, not glorified, not blessed. Sanctified, made holy, the virgin's womb. God dwelt and took his human nature in the womb of Mary. And as we uh, have been told from the Psalms, You, O God, brought my inner parts into being. You wove me in my mother's womb. And so, when we look again, you know, at this is all this is all part of being a human being. So not only are we created an image of God giving birth, uh, forming a familial. Trinity on our home by having children, uh, creating other human beings by the creative power of God, participating in his genetic power, his genesis, to bring others into existence in his image and likeness. But then particularly, particularly the womb 
of the woman is seen as a place of holiness, a place that God is going to heal, a place that God is going to use in order to save mankind. So that, that's a very small section of our ontology as humans, our authentic being as human beings. But in re regards to abortion, can you see where we're going with this? The world has reversed our ontology, our authentic ontology. The created order is that the husband and the wife, created in the image of God, co-creating with him new human beings in the image of God, is the in the praised and blessed and sanctified womb. Doing that, participating in that, is a part of being not only really a human, but like God, as we are called to be. Where today, what do we have today? Today we have per, uh, particularly or predominantly unmarried men and women, ignorant of their true ontology, destroying children in the womb, praising immoral sexual practices, praising our ability through technology to divide intimacy from fertility, something completely foreign to the natural human order, boasting even in sterility, boasting that I have been responsible by getting a vasectomy or having a tubal ligation. I am free now. I am free to indulge myself Lustfully, because I am now sterile. Think about that. The dilemma that abortion brings us to, uh, let me make sure I'm not jumping too far ahead. The dilemma that abortion brings us to is, is not, and I say this very carefully with great respect for the millions of martyred children, but the greatest problem, from my perspective, is not that millions of children are being killed. That might sound shocking. It is absolutely wrong. It is absolutely condemnable. But the only reason that is happening is because things like abortion are dehumanizing the human race. We are becoming something other than human beings. We are losing our ontology. Uh, in, a, in a study that I found from uh, a university in Australia, two uh, you know, well-established uh, psychological researchers and, and professors in ethics, talk about redefining a word, in Australia, and this is what we're facing these days. Think about this idea of being dehumanized. Think about the sanctity of the womb, God wanting us to procreate, bring other human beings into the world in his image because that is, that is what we are. That is what it means to be a human being. From the Australian uh, study in justification for post-birth abortion. This is a discussion of why why can we not kill children after they're born? This is not about pills. This is not about abortion during pregnancy. This is not about going into the womb and cutting the baby up and taking it out in pieces. This is about people going full term, delivering the child, deciding after the fact they do not want the child. Why should they not be allowed to kill the child? This is today. Right? I mean, this isn't the Roman Empire. This isn't a, 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 you know, the Mayan civilization sacrificing people. This is intellectuals in the world today. The moral status of an infant is equivalent to that of a fetus. The moral status of an infant is equivalent, the same, to that of the fetus. In the sense that both lack those properties that justify the attribution of a right to life to an individual. Both a fetus and a newborn certainly are human beings and potential persons. Okay, keep in mind a baby laying on the table in its diapers. Okay, we're not talking about a woman pregnant anymore. 
Certainly they are human beings and potential persons, but neither is a person in the sense of subject to a moral right to life. For we take person to mean an individual. This is defining personhood. This is ontology. You are not a human being until you are capable of attributing to yourself your own existence. And the value of being deprived of your existence. Think how old a child has to be before it knows it exists and is going to be disappointed when you say you're going to kill him. <laughs> Sorry for being so ironic, but it's making the point. This means that many non human animals and mentally retarded human individuals are persons, but that all individuals who are not in the condition of attributing any value to their own existence are not persons. Merely being human is not in itself a reason for ascribing to someone the right to life. Just being a human being does not mean you have the right to live. You have to be a person as they have defined. Properties which will make them persons in the sense of subjects of a moral right to life. That is the point at which they that is that will be the point at which they are able to make aims for their life and appreciate their own existence. So that's uh, you know intellectual speak, but uh, what we're really trying to say is that there are authorities in the realms of ethics in the world right now who are saying that until your infant on the table, maybe even your toddler, until they can set goals for their own life, right? I want to buy a car. <laughs> and until they can regret that you are going to kill them, and this would include also a... Uh, 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 mentally handicapped people or older people. Imagine a person with dementia who when you say to them, we're going to take you to the hospital today and euthanize you, they can't have a negative reaction. They can't comprehend even what you're saying. Then they are not a person anymore. And they do not have a right to life. And so we are, we are radically in, 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 in in our effort to resist abortion, what we have to be resisting is the dehumanization of the entire human race. It is unfortunately just a <laughs> symptom of really what is going on. Um, and I have, uh, forgive me, I've talked too long already, but I have a small outline that I'm actually going to skip on what, you know, what does a person do when they when they realize what they have done is wrong. In the end, they have to come to a, an understanding of a true ontology. What does it mean to be a human being? Realize that what they did is, is, is murder. And then enter into repentance. And we know that part of the journey, right? Entering into confession, having a spiritual father, discovering the forgiveness that God will grant to a person when they repent. For I am, as we pray at every liturgy, I have appointed repentance for salvation. Um, that part of it, though, as Orthodox Christians, you are, you are predominantly aware of. Um, and I would like to, but I would like to stop by reading just a couple comments by women who had abortions, these are Christian women, and we're talking, we have to remember today, we are talking I, about, and I, when I saw this number, I, I, I almost couldn't believe it. I, I looked around and looked around and tried to make sure per, the site wasn't just wrong somehow. Um, because I knew that there had been millions of children worldwide aborted. But the, the website that I found that is just called the Abortion Counter, Counter. Uh, it shows abortions worldwide since 1973, and it is right now over a hundred, I'm, I'm sorry, it's almost 
1.5 billion, billion children. 1 billion, 444 million children. 444, I'm not good at math. A billion, 444 million children in the world since 1973. So just a couple of comments from uh, wonderful, actually wonderful pro-life websites out there collecting stories, telling, uh, uh, encouraging women to, to not get an abortion, telling them how to recover from the effects when they find out they're in the 81% that give one and have some sort of mental health breakdown afterwards, or they fall into severe uh, drug and alcohol addiction, suicidal behavior. These are anonymous contributions. For years I suffered with sorrow, deep sorrow, grief, regret, and remorse, knowing I had my own children killed. I turned to drugs and alcohol to numb the pain and the shame of abortion for many years. It affected my parenting because my son that is alive, one of my sons is alive, but the other children are not. It affected my self-esteem and my worth. Just one abortion is enough to sink your future into the muck of depression, addictions, and relationship difficulties. Countless Christ-centered, God-fearing women, even, carry around the shame and the secret of abortion. They serve in ministries, they love their families, they do their jobs, while they silently suffer, thinking that if no one knows, they will be able to just move on. Women's hearts long for the healing process, but they sometimes fear condemnation if their secret is exposed. They might, may not say it out loud, but deep inside they wonder if what they did was too awful for even Jesus to forgive. And they fear the rejection of their loved ones. As for me, I continue even now to move through the stages of healing. The birth of my grandson, this is a grandma talking, revived intense feelings of loss. Each time I look into his precious face, I mourn anew. But the difference is now that I not only lay at my Savior's feet, I jump into the shelter of his lap. And I soak in the love and the healing that only he can bring. This is from a third woman. 29 years ago, 29 years have passed since I made the terrible decision to end my pregnancy through abortion. Abortion ended the life of my innocent baby and nearly destroyed my life as well. Last year, 28 years after her abortion, last year I began the healing of my soul through repentance and confession and baptism in the Orthodox faith. While I still have many tears for the loss of my innocent child, my tears remind me, that, remind me that I am loved by an all-compassionate and merciful God whose love for us is beyond our comprehension. The time to repent for our sins is in this lifetime. There is no repentance after we die. We must reconcile ourselves to God now. Through the prayers of our Holy Father, so Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. <coughs> I, I have, uh, I want, I've got some handouts for you that I'll make available on the table uh, towards the door. One of them is a prayer for the protection of the unborn and the forgiveness of those who are having abortions or performing abortions. Another one uh, is available on the internet. It is uh, recent research that abortion harms women. It's two pages, so make sure you get them. 25, the 25 top documented uh, evidence of the psychological damage to women through abortion. And then another very inspiring and convicting one that just makes it concrete and clear for us as Orthodox Christians 
is uh, it's from orthodoxytoday.org, the fathers of the Orthodox Church on abortion. And if you read them, you will be equipped, you really will be equipped spiritually and intellectually to talk about this topic with other people. God bless you.